Our speaker today is Adam Lewenberg. He is the president and CEO of Postal Advocate, the only male audit and recovery firm in the United States and Canada. We manage a portfolio of 182,000 pieces of mailing equipment and over 77,000 online postage users for the largest U.S. companies. Adam speaks and teaches nationally on mail savings and industry trends. He is a former industry co-chair of the Boston Postal Customer Council and Mailing Systems Management Association. He is CMDSS and MDC certified. He is a featured writer for Mailing Systems Technology Magazine. Adam worked for one of the largest mailing vendors for over 17 years. He was the director of national sales for pre-sort, tabletop inserts, addressing hardware, software, and green offerings. And he was one of the top five account managers nationally working with some of the nation's largest accounts. Over to you, Adam. Thanks, Michaela. So we have two months left to replace your non-compliant mailing equipment. So we're gonna go over what you need to know, background of it, how you plan for it, everything that you need. The main parts we're gonna cover are the details of the change, what devices are impact, how do you create impact, excuse me, how do you create visibility of the equipment that needs to be migrated, what options do you have for mail equipment? There are right sizing strategies that can save you up to 80% when you're doing the renewals. There's enterprise online postage solutions, where and why these systems make sense. For how do you do planning and implementation? What happens after the deadline? And then ongoing visibility and control, because there's gonna be future migration phases. So what's happening? The USPS is decertifying all information-based indicia IBI compliant meters by June 30th, 2024, because they want all the new devices to be the new standard, which is called intelligent mail indicia IMI, um, and, or the, the mail will no longer be approved for use. So here's what you need to know. First off, current IBI devices need to be replaced. They can't be retrofitted. So there's no like software download or anything like that you can do to these devices. You physically need a brand new postage machine. The USPS is doing this because they want a higher level of security and visibility in their mail system. They want to know what mail class is, how you submitted it, you know, a lot more detail than the current meters allow for. Metering devices will need to be constantly connected to the internet versus only at the time of refill. And this is one of the biggest reasons why the post office is going through this. A lot of the old style meters, you hit refill and it creates a connection, downloads your postage or checks your meter balance and then disconnects. And the requirement for many of these devices is that they only have to connect every 120 days. So that's not sufficient for the new standards the post office is trying to put in. You know. We estimate somewhere between 30 to 70% of the meters in the United States won't meet these new standards and need to be replaced in a very short time period. The reason the post office is doing it this is because they wanna better automate their operations. They want higher security in their systems. There's a rising threat that they're dealing with. They wanna validate that you're putting the correct postage amounts on your pieces. They wanna be able to issue refunds automatically through the devices versus filling out forms. And they want a lot more control over what mail's entering their network, which they just don't have with these older style meters. These are the meter models that we believe need to be replaced by the deadlines. There's three phases to this migration. The biggest phase is June 30th, 2024, where you can see the meters that we know about from Pitney Bowes and Quadient. Um, FP, you should go to FP to validate them. You should still, for any of these, validate these requirements with your meter vendors. The reason why it's such a huge number of meters that are needing to be replaced in this first round by June 30th is because it's the lower mid-end meters that are needing to be replaced. The things that are being replaced in 26 and 27 are the higher volume you know, devices that you would seek more in corporate mail centers. But the lower end, medium end devices, there are a lot more of those out there. So you may not have them in your corporate hub, but you may have them in field locations you have scattered around the country. And that's why this is such a big impact. So the deadline is June 30th for this first phase, but the post office has a grace period where they're saying meters need to be taken out of service. They can be, they can be used out of compliance in theory until December 31st, 24. But there are issues with that. Each meter vendor has their own policy of how they're handling this whole issue. Some meter vendors are having monthly connections where, you know, instead of having to connect these meters every 120 days, you're gonna to have to start connecting them once a month. Some have deadlines where the last time you can refill your meter is by certain dates. That is not December 31st, it's much earlier than that. And some vendors have cutoffs where they have to get these machines back in inventory earlier than others. 
then the, then the deadline hits. So don't assume you have until 1231 to make these changes. But there's there's things that are going to push you to be doing it sooner. And, you know, we're trying to get all of our clients at least to be able to hit the deadline or do it, make sure that it's being done over the summer. The client challenges that we're seeing with this migration, the biggest is network connectivity. Not like these meters have to be constantly connected to the network and not every organization wants meters constantly connected to the network. There are IT issues sometimes with meters on their network. Um, if you can't connect meters to the network, there the meter vendors typically will offer mobile connector devices. Think of it like a mobile cell phone, mobile phone subscription that you basically can connect in bypassing the need for having that meter on your network. You just have to pay a, an extra rental fee basically for these devices. The cost. Cost of mailing equipment after COVID went up significantly. Most of the devices that need to be replaced are older devices and are probably on legacy agreements where you're paying rates that didn't behoove you to make changes before. So you have to expect if you're going like for like with these units, you're going to be spending a lot more money with the new equipment than on the previous. Creating visibility of the equipment that needs to be replaced. So if you're only a company that has one location, you know, it's not such a big issue. But if you're an organization that has lots of locations, you know, it, it's difficult in many cases to get the visibility to where you have all this equipment throughout the country and which items need to be replaced. We're going to talk more about that in detail of how you do it. Collecting the requirements of the new equipment. What do you need when you're getting this new equipment? What features do you need? What options? Putting the cost between models and between vendors and models, implementing the new units, returning old equipment, and then making sure the postage on the old units are refunded. This is especially an issue if you're changing vendors or account numbers. There's only two months to make this change. There, we estimate there's about 300,000 devices left in the country that need to be switched, and there's only about two months to make this change. Granted, you have a grace period, but we strongly recommend getting this done by the end of Q3 at the latest. Creating visibility. So we manage the largest postal portfolio probably in the world. So everything that I'm going to talk about, you can do yourself. This is what we do for accounts in order to gain visibility. You can do the same things yourself, um, but I want to tell you the steps that are required in order to create visibility. If you have offices scattered around the country, um, or in, you know, even in your local area, besides just one location, you know, organization, these are the steps that you should find. You need to obtain the account numbers for your equipment and for your leases. You need equipment models to see if they match the list above, the list that we showed, to see if, like, is the model compliant or not compliant. And you need serial numbers because you need the serial numbers to gain access on the vendor's web portals. You need to figure out your contract expiration dates. You may have contracts that don't expire until 2025. Beyond the expiration, beyond this deadline, you need to talk to your vendors about what options you have to make sure you're not paying remaining balances on those. You need to know the mail volumes that you're being done at each of these offices to make sure that you're right-sizing this stuff appropriately. And then what features do you need in these new solutions for feeding, weighing, accounting? So the methodology that we follow is See if you have any reports or agreements provided by your mailing vendor. If not, and most people don't, to be frank, um, go to accounts payable and then do a search on the main mailing vendor names. The main mailing vendors are Pitney Bowes, Quadiant, Franco Type Pistalia, FP, um, Stamps.com. Those are the main mail vendors in the space. From that accounts payable search, request copies of invoices. And those copies of invoices will give you account numbers and potentially serial numbers. Create an account on the meter vendor's website, so on Pitney Bowes' website, Quadiant's website, FP's website, and then link the, your locations to that website. And what you need to link is you need an account number and a serial number from each piece of equipment, from each location that has equipment, and that links everything up. Then once things are linked, search the online accounts for postage usage, contract expiration dates. That Pitney Bowes has that available. Some of the other vendors don't publish that. And then equipment details. Um, call the meter vendors for any other visibility items required. If you have over 30 locations, we'll build you this list and connect all this stuff and provide you this visibility as a no cost or obligation assessment um, to show you what sort of savings are available inside your fleet. But these are the steps that we would follow to do it, and you can certainly do these on your own. Mailing solutions. We're going to start at postage meters sort of in the middle. Postage meters basically started about $25 to $100 a month. 
And a standalone meter means you feed a piece in by hand, one at a time, and it runs through the machine. And they cost about $25 to $100 a month. Then you have automatic feed machines where you can take a pile of envelopes, put them on a stacker, and shoots it through the machine. And those cost about $170 to $300 a month. And then you have mid-level units that have the same automatic feed functions, but they also have an internal weighing system that weighs the stuff as it goes through it. And those cost $350 to $600 a month. And then this high volume, you know, for people doing more than, you know, eight to $10,000 a month in postage kind of thing, um, they have high volume of the same features as the mid-levels for seven to $1,300 a month. The reason I'm telling you these prices is it matters what features and volumes you're doing. There's also online postage, which we'll go into some detail on, and that's 10 to $30 a month for a single site license. And if you're looking at enterprise versions that can be spread across your entire organization, that's anywhere from one to $10 per month um, for enterprise licenses based on the number of locations you have. Right sizing opportunities. You can save, we average about 74% savings in this category of mailing equipment because we follow these right sizing strategies. You can do the same thing yourself. First off, if you have an internal weighing system in one of these units, you need it. Internal weighing systems cost two to $300 per month. Automatic feeding machines, feeding options cost 100 to $200 a month, as we saw in that previous chart. So do you do enough volume to justify those features? Is the internal weighing system enough of a savings to justify the other costs? And those are questions you have to ask. The scales. The, the meter vendors can provide scales that are 10, 15, 30, 70, $149 pounds, excuse me. Those scales add 30 to $100 per month to the cost versus the standard scales that cost $5 a month. You can go to Staples or Office Max or Office Depot and you can buy a 150 pound scale at one time for $113. It doesn't always make sense to buy high capacity scales connected to your postage meter. External scales are much less expensive and can drive costs down. All the features of your current mailing system being utilized, all the mail accounting functions, custom weighing, conveyors, stackers, special services. Do you need all those features that maybe are on your current agreement, on your current equipment, um, in your next agreement, are they being utilized? Can online postage be an option versus low volume meters? If you're doing less than, usually the threshold we sort of give clients is about $300 a month. People who do less than $300 a month, you know, have the, you know, have sort of some flexibility whether they use online postage or postage meter. There's a 20 plus percent savings for parcels and it can be expanded to UPS and FedEx processing with the online platforms. And if you have more than 10 locations or work from home staff, Enterprise post online postage options should be considered. So this is just gives you sort of a checklist you can think about. Online postage, what is it? It's the most common remote mailing solution. It's a, typically a subscription model. You can print postage from any computer and you either print directly on stamp sheets like you see here, or you can print directly onto the envelope or some people get direct thermal label printers although it's pretty uncommon just because it, cre it kills the flexibility of these online postage platforms. If you're doing shipping labels, you could either print directly on white paper or you could print on Avery style stock, but you're printing a four by six shipping label with the address, a barcode and your return address all in one. It's inexpensive compared to postage meters, typical costs are 10 to $30 a month. It's cloud-based, there's no software you have to download, easy to deploy, you have visibility to every single piece of mail or parcel that you've done versus postage meters. You just know that you refilled your postage meter with a certain amount of money. And some systems have multiple carrier options so you could do, you could compare rates between UPS and FedEx. There's a significant postage savings with online postage over postage meters or going to the post office and buying stamps. And I wanna explain where that is. With postage meters, um, and online postage, you get the metered postage rate, which today is 64 cents versus 68 cents if you go to the post office. With return receipt, the online postage tools have ways to get electronic return receipt. Some postage meters have that. It's typically an additional option or subscription you have to sign up for, but that's included in many of the online postage subscriptions. But when you get the parcels, which is ground advantage, priority mail, priority mail express, you're getting anywhere between 20 to actually 50 plus percent savings based on the weight um, by using electronic because instead of printing a meter imprint for your package, which is a retail rate, 
you get a commercial rate because you're submitting the transaction electronically through the device. Some of the meter vendors are including these types of subscriptions on their meters, basically including an online postage tool in their meter agreements to be able to get these types of rate structures. But online postage subscriptions standalone can do this on their own and get these rates. So this ties to the enterprise story. And I just want, this is a weird concept, but I just want to make sure that everybody follows this. So in many organizations, it's easier to send a $15 overnight than a 64 cent letter. And that doesn't make, excuse me, any intuitive sense, you know, from the way I'm saying it. But think about it. Most organizations will have either use UPS or FedEx. And with those, they'll get free systems. UPS has UPS Campus Ship, FedEx has FedEx.com or FedEx Ship Manager. And there's an administrator and everyone throughout the organization who wants to ship packages, just has a license on that. They can go to a website, they can process their packages. And then everyone across the organization has access. And then all the charges are summarized, downloaded in Excel, and it's charged back appropriately to the departments. Now think about, and so, universal access, every location, any home office user where you decide you want to distribute shipping, they can do it. Now think about mail. Do they have a postage meter in the office where they're paying 30 to $1,300 a month? Do they have an online postage subscription? Do they send end users to the post office to buy stamps, in which case they're paying a premium for the postage, they got to go to the post office and they don't have the right denominations of postage? Or do they courier mail between facilities? We see this a lot in healthcare or in banks where they're couriering mail from all these different locations to a hub and they're spending five to $15 sometimes daily to move mail around. No process across, defined process across an organization. Location determines how mail gets processed based on if they purchased any technology. And there's almost no visibility across an organization to postage spends. It's a fragmented process between you know, equipment vendors, petty cash, and credit cards. And because of this, only we find about a third of locations even have mail equipment, you know, when you go to the typical office environment. So it's easier for many of those offices, people, or those who work from home to send it FedEx. And, and that's the wrong story. And so what's interesting is the, these enterprise online postage options we see is the fastest growth segment of the mailing industry. And what's unique about it is, that there are, there are options today where you can have all the locations across an entire enterprise on one license and it can be shared, controlled and distributed postage to have the same experience as you would have with UPS or FedEx, but offering better costs. So enterprise online postage is really the same as standalone on online postage with the difference being it can be controlled with a central administration license, which makes it easier to onboard new users and locations, you can report on all locations and user activity across the entire organization from a central dashboard. You can manage your billing subscription, supplies and postage. You can control your user access. This includes removing users who are no longer active. Some systems have single sign-on, so you can connect them directly to the, to the corporate active directory. And when someone's no longer employed, they're booted out of the system automatically and they don't need to enter usernames and passwords. The free UPS and FedEx systems don't even have that option. These platforms can be expanded to process UPS and FedEx with real-time rate shopping by day of week or time of day. They have certified mail capabilities that are far superior with firm mail books creations. They save $1.33 for electronic return receipt. And every signature is stored in these electronic repositories that can be pulled up. They're getting these files once a week called BPOP files that are stored once a week that has every signature of every packet, every certified item that came in. And so it's all sitting there at your fingertips versus having to track them one by one. If you have more than 10 locations using online postage or you know 10 locations that have you know low end meters or access needs of postage, we recommend looking at these enterprise licenses. Where we come in is for some of our clients, we're acting as the central administrator for these systems. Regardless if we do it or if you do it yourself, if you're interested in these enterprise online postage platforms, it needs a central administrator. It needs someone to define the requirements, implement the system, train onboard users, manage user access. Um, the biggest thing you need is case management, which means anytime there's an issue, like in our, for our clients, we give them a, a case management platform where they can like say what the issue is, who they are, and a case is created and dedicated agents supporting it. If you manage it yourself, you need to make sure there's a central go-to person inside your organization that can manage this. You need to monitor usage, 
report on chargeback and key metrics, quantify the savings, and expand and promote usage throughout the organization. But these systems save huge amounts of money and provide a visibility and control that has not been present in the mail industry up to now. Migration planning and implementation. Create your own inventory report. Document your postage spends by location. There's no way you can do the right sizing unless you, you know, do it this way. Understand the features in your location's need. Compare the pricing and features with multiple vendors. Don't just assume your current vendor has all the offerings. Order the new solutions. Validate the new solution is installed. Remove the old systems. Make sure postage is recovered and make sure all locations across the enterprise are covered. These are the steps that people are gonna have to do to make sure they're compliant with this regulation. Ongoing visibility and control. It's important, this isn't a one-time act, unfortunately. The reason that you wanna have ongoing visibility and control to this is because there are gonna be more things coming up on this. There's ongoing right, size, right sizing needs. Mail volumes are gonna to continue to go down equipment's going to need to be right sized. If we're averaging 74% by doing proper right sizing for our clients, you can do the same thing by having the proper ongoing visibility and control. Invoice validations. The mailing vendors are far from perfect billers. We've recovered $23 million from our clients and in reviewing invoices and dormant postage accounts and things like that, it's important to know that what you're paying for and make sure that someone has visibility to all the invoice detail. Postage management. Of that 23 million, 13 million of it was dormant postage that was, you know, that basically nobody ever thought to go get back. These are the places that you find this dormant postage. So you have overfunding the meters. There are devices that you have out there in your enterprises sitting on huge balances of postage that are going to take years to use. Basically, someone loaded their meter for $10,000, but they or a huge amount, but they only do small amounts of postage a year and it'll take years to be able to use it. That money needs to be returned. Pre-funding accounts. Oftentimes people are sending huge balances in to postage accounts. Sometimes they have them set on autopilot that they're funding every month, developing these huge balances of postage that will never get used. That money needs to be refunded. Advance accounts. So the meter vendors have, or at least two of the three meter vendors have pre like advance accounts where they'll loan you money like a credit card. When meters get returned, that money goes back to those accounts and it sits as a credit. You need to make sure that that money gets refunded. The state's unclaimed funds office. Pitney Bowes will turn over the funds to, um, to the different state's unclaimed funds offices. But, and this is typically from return meters. They're the only vendor that we've seen do this. The other vendors don't do that because basically Pitney Bowes has their own bank. The other vendors fund directly to the United States Postal Service. Postal Service doesn't require the, those funds to be turned over to the state's unclaimed funds offices. That basically that money sits at the United States Postal Service with no visibility to where it is. Location support. You wanna make sure your offices have the best mailing options and software support. The mailing vendors are gonna be reaching out to your offices, trying to get them to do renewals for equipment that may or may not be in their best interest. There's two more migration cycles. There's 2026, and then there's a bigger one in 2027 that you're gonna to have to be prepared for. That's why it's important to have these ongoing visibility. But most important, and this is something that like people have overlooked, in the last 29 months, we have had the largest postage increase in the history of the Postal Service. Rates have gone up 23 to 56% with an expected two rate increases annually. We're about to get another eight to 10% increase in July for postage. And if you're not monitoring this volume, you're not taking advantage of what savings may be available around your postage, especially your highest volume postage locations. So it's very important to maintain an ongoing visibility and control. What we do as an organization is we help the largest organizations manage this mail spend. We've saved our clients $87 million, 182,000 pieces of mail equipment that we manage for our clients. And the average savings has been about $1.8 million. You know, we're here if you need help. This is what we do. We have 224 years of combined industry experience and the only web-based tools that can manage your spends across all the, enter all the different vendors in one place for you to be able to see what's happening. Our clients are across every industry. 
it doesn't make any difference. We we found our biggest sectors are usually financial services and healthcare, but we have doesn't make any difference. It's just do you have a decent number of locations or disparate mail spans that need oversight? And for any client, we'll do a no cost analysis of your spends, and it's no cost or no obligation for any services. We'll we're basically build you an inventory of all your equipment. We'll make sure that you have visibility to what needs to be compliant, and we'll help you know basically show you what's happening in your fleet. And if you're interested in that type of analysis, what we need for clients is a letter of authority that gives us approval to research your mailing spends, any mail equipment reports you may have, current or historical, an accounts payable export to these vendor names, which are the most common in the mail space. Um, from that, we'll request a, a subset of PDF copies of invoices um, so we can get the detail that we need, so we can help cre you cre help create that online postage account that we talked about to have gr more granular level of visibility. If you want us to do a, a rate shop comparison for UPS and FedEx, you know we can pull that. We need one to six months of invoice detail in Excel, and then meet with us to review the results. And the outcomes you'll get is we'll give you a full equipment inventory, contract details, um, your postage spends by location what equipment needs to be migrated, and then an optimized mail plan that maximizes savings. Everything we talked about, you can do on your own. We gave you the tools and we'll send out this deck so you can do these things yourself. If you need help though, we're here and this is all we do and we can be really good at it. So I wanna close this where this is not the first meter migration that we've had. We've had multiple different meter migrations in the history of the Postal Service. You used to be able to fill your meter at post office, and then you had to switch it to fill it over the phone. You used to fill it over the phone, and then you had to fill it over a network connection. Then you had to have a 2D like barcode printed in the meter imprint box. That was another forced migration. So the meter vendors have had you know, equipment obsolescence issues that have caused different migrations. None in my 30 years have been as big as this. And the main, we're, we're over 50% of the meter population in the United States is being impacted in a very short period of time. And that's why this, is, this one is so significant compared to anything else we've had. So I wanna open it up to, I wanna thank everyone for coming today. We're gonna open it up to questions. And, um, and I wanna say again, thank you for everyone for being here. And hopefully this is a simple process for you to be able to get this migration taken care of. Thanks, so, Adam. Okay, Hello, okay. everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We have had a couple questions come through, um, but I also want to remind you of the ways you can ask questions. So you can either raise your hand and we'll unmute you uh, to ask your question, or you can type your question in the chat box um, and we can answer your question that way. I wanted to point your attention to the social links there. We post more frequently on there so that we have webinars. So if you need any information from us on a more frequent basis, that's a good place to go. We'll be talking a lot more about the meter migration as that June deadline approaches. And then Adam's email is also listed there um, in case you have any questions for him about anything he talked about today. Um, several people have asked if the presentation and the recording are going to be sent out, um, and it will. It will be in the follow-up email that you'll receive um, in the next day or two, and also it will be on our website um, for your availability under presentations for the presentation deck. And then if you go under videos, that's where the recording of the webinar will be. Um, so another question we have is, do you think the post office will extend the deadline? Um. I don't. There, this has been going on for a couple of years. I think the meter vendors are very like in control of this and like you know putting lots of marketing and resources into it. So I would be very surprised if the post office extends this out. Okay. And then um, another question we have is why would online postage have better postage rates than postage meters themselves? Sure. It's mainly the area where they have better rates is mainly on the parcel side. So all of the priority mail, express mail, priority mail express and ground advantage, because since you're printing a four by six shipping label and then submitting electronically to the postal service, you get not, you don't you get the retail rate that you get through a postage meter or if you go to the post office, you get a commercial rate. Um, so that in itself is usually about a 15 to 20% savings. But on top of that, online postage subscriptions, many of them have basically what I would call a negotiated service agreement to the Postal Service, where they're getting additional discounts, where they have like almost fixed prices up to about 20 pounds based on the dimensions 
So it basically becomes a shape-based rate where if your stuff is, you know, in, you know, less than a cubic foot and, you know, potentially smaller, there's extra discounts you can get. They give fixed rates up to certain, you know, up to 20 pounds. And that's where the savings in the 50 and up to actually in some cases 70% come in. All right, and another question. What happens to our meter if we do nothing? If you do nothing, meters from, it, it's gonna vary by vendor, but we're hearing things like, like you can definitely assume you're not gonna be able to do any rate changes because rates are gonna go up in July, I mean in January, excuse me, of this year, of next year. You won't be able to fill those meters with postage. And then, you know, we believe that many of them won't be able to print postage after that date. They physically will just be inoperable. All right. Well, that looks like that's the last question we have. So if there are no further questions, I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. Please make sure to fill out the survey that will appear at the conclusion of the webinar. And be sure to check out our social media pages to find helpful information from us on a more frequent basis. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Um, actually, it looks like we had one more question come in. Okay. Um, it. it said, for clients who have multiple 50-plus locations and an IT team, do you feel it is beneficial to involve them? Should we advise them what the network requirements for the meters are? Definitely. Definitely, if you have if you have that type of locations, you want to involve them to make sure that, you know, there isn't a huge amount of traffic. It's just the fact that these things are constantly connected to make sure there's no issues about that. The other question is, do you, you probably most likely, if you have 50 locations, have some offices, some locations already compliant, and for them to use that as a standard to try to make it easier for the, for the locations that you need to get on. But if you have 50 locations with meters, the most likely, you know, 70, you know, 70 to 90% of those are doing really low volumes. You should consider the online postage platforms because they would save you significant amounts of money in the 50 to 70% range, if not more. All right. Well, that truly was our last question. We haven't had any more come in. So like I said, I want to thank you guys all for joining today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.